So shalom, good evening, U.S. team to everyone in Israel and in Hungary. Welcome to this very interesting talk we're going to have tonight with some great panelists. But before starting the talk, let's. Uh, I would like to ask the audience if they can hear me and uh, and everything is okay technically. It's okay. I see some okays on the other side. Well, we are in a new world, uh, so actually we're going to have only two panelists uh, tonight uh, to, because of a technical problem, but two truly wonderful panelists. Uh, let me in shortly introduce them. The first one is uh, from Israel, is Dr. Ophir Aivri, Vice President for Academic Affairs of the Herzog Institute and the Director of its National uh, Strategy Initiative. And, Dr. Haigri is both an expert in Israeli internal politics and also in external politics. So I think we will also talk about not only about Israeli internal politics, but we will discuss some issues which are very important for Israel and, and, I, and I guess for the world. What will happen in Syria? What's the situation with Iran? Maybe even touch upon Russia, if you agree, sir, to discuss these issues. And our second guest is uh, Mr. Schultz Chaplegi. Deputy Director for International Affairs at the Anto Yosef Knowledge Center. Welcome, Mr. Chepregi. Can you hear us? Thank you, I can hear you. Wonderful, wonderful. So, well, this is the first Israeli, but before that, sorry, some technical issues. My colleagues are telling me that I have to tell you about the questions, of course. So, um, I would like to ask everyone to pose the questions in writing in the chat. And we will, uh, we will uh, read up the questions. Please uh, pose your name, uh, write down your name. And, and if you are from, a, uh, from an institute or for, for some press, so please uh, note that thing too. But before that, I would like to underline that we are under Chatham House rules. So that's how we ask our speakers. So please, please keep that in, in mind if you write or if you talk about uh, tonight's uh, program. So. To turn back to our subject, Israeli elections, I think uh, we have the fourth cliffhanger in, uh, in two years in Israel. And actually from Europe, it's very hard to see the intricacies of Israeli uh, internal politics, the inner workings of, of, uh, of Israeli internal politics. It's a very fast changing, uh, highly competitive environment. So could you first, uh, I am asking two panelists, give us a crash course uh, of what happened in Israel in the last few years. How come this is the fourth selection? How come this is maybe not enough and there will be a fifth selection? So could you give us a little recap of what happened in the last two years? And what is your projection? What will happen after this fourth selection? Uh, Dr. Haivi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, the short version, the very short version, is that uh, it's simple, simply that uh, in the last four elections, there is no uh, outright uh, majority for the, um, for the Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, to form a, a strong uh, government, a coalition or whatever. And uh, the deeper reasons are that, uh, uh, I, I can say there are, uh, I would say two reasons that are converging uh, and creating this problem. One is that uh, Netanyahu is already um, uh, in, in, in office for a long time. So he's like uh, from 2009 to, to this time. And naturally in politics, uh, with time, sometime, some, at least some politician create, you create more, uh, there is an attrition, you know, between politicians that have like bad blood that they, uh, uh, doesn't go away. Uh, so this is only natural for someone who is in office a long time. On the other hand, we have a political system that is uh, uh, built in to create coalition, meaning instead of, of uh, a system uh, producing one clear winner, it's, it's built into, it's a, 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 basically Israel is a proportional system. And there is no uh, benefit that uh, the biggest party receives. In some system, the biggest party receives like a bonus 
of 10 or 20 percent so it can create a strong coalition in israel that's not the case so uh it means that the ruling party basically netanyahu for uh 12 years uh always received around a quarter of the votes uh because there is an incentive for smaller parties to so there was an attempt to uh, solve this problem by uh, bringing up the uh, threshold to 3%. So that very small party went in. But the, actually the effect was that now there are a lot of middle parties. In Israel, there are, at the moment, there are not two, two large parties like left or right. There is the Likud Netanyahu's party that has about 30, 30 seats it, with among 120, so a quarter and many other parties and, and so this uh, this system the, co the combination between the long uh, 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 the long time that the uh, that there is in play is in in place so cre it created many enemies on the other hand there is a uh, the system is very fractured so uh, we we see that in the last uh, two years we had again and again a situation where uh, uh, numerically, no one had a strong uh, position, and many smaller parties having a grudge against Netanyahu have no incentive actually to go into a coalition. So this is basically the the, the reason, the combination of two two factors, in my view. Wonderful. Uh, before giving the floor uh, to uh, George Chaplegi, I'm one technical. Thing I would like to ask for audience that you should switch on your cameras if it's possible. Uh, it would be a courtesy for us. So could you uh, please switch on your cameras? Thank you very much. So Joel, the floor is yours. Uh, the same question for you. Yeah, I agree with, with the two points. I would like to add a third one that the, the flip side is also true. Um, the, the Israeli political map is very fragmented. There are many parties who have bad blood between them and Netanyahu, but also there's a block behind Netanyahu who would not uh, go to the so-called other side. Uh, and that means that uh, out of the 120 uh, Knesset seats, something like 15% of the, of the mandates can go to both uh, direction or maybe even less. Uh, we can get into the intricacies of, of the different position of the different parties, but the really the problem is that when you go to elections in, in Israel in the last two years, you already basically know whom these parties are going to nominate uh, to become uh, the prime minister. And there's very little moving between them unless there's a national emergency. The only reason why we had a, a, a relatively stable government for one year in Israel from the, from the, the spring of 2020 is because there was the coronavirus crisis and Benny Gantz, the former um, uh, chief of staff, staff made the decision to, to actually partly sacrifice his own political career and uh, make a coalition deal with, with, uh, with Benjamin Netanyahu. So we must see the, the importance of this kind of black swan uh, events in, in Israeli politics. Of course, I'm not saying that something like this is going to happen now, hopefully nothing bad is going to happen now, but this is the only thing which basically rewrote internal Israeli political logic. And hopefully there won't be anything like this uh, now in, 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 in this instance. So the problem is that really this dualism that on the one hand, the Israeli political system is very fragmented. On the other hand, uh, uh, you have the Netanyahu camp and you have the anti-Netanyahu camp. And this is really something that that is quite new in Israel. And, be, and beforehand, you could see the Likud Labour Party coalitions uh, working quite well. And now, uh, now this logic is, is, uh, is, does not exist anymore. So as a follow up to this question, may I ask you, gentlemen, that do you see a pass for forming a government for Prime Minister Netanyahu? Does he have a chance now. He almost had the 61 seats before the Arab party got in, uh, just with a, a few votes. Uh, so after that, is there a pass for, uh, for that Mr. Netanyahu to, to become prime minister again and to form a government again? Uh, Dr. I, I first? 
Should I go first? Yes. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. So um, the point I want to make here is that uh, uh, the, we should understand that there is a difference between the the uh, bad blood between Netanyahu and other politicians and the basic political outlook. Because in fact, all these elections in Israel return about, uh, I would say, 60% uh, of the votes for the right, meaning the various parties of the right are worth between 60 and 70%. So actually, the, the, uh, the big problem is not about policy. There isn't like uh, the left and the right have different policies and the, the clash is bringing a, a lockdown. Actually, uh, on policy, the party, there would be a coalition in five minutes because the policy is from the whole party and the right party and the other and the religious parties and so on are, and the Likud are, are very close. So uh, basically it's a matter of, I would say, personality. So the question is basically, uh, if Netanyahu uh, will be able to create a coalition, uh, the problem is that that uh, part of the animosity towards Netanyahu is the fact that he is now he is being in, indicted in the courts. Now in Israel, the law states that uh, until you are uh, uh, for for as long as as the uh, trial goes on, a prime minister is doesn't have to resign. So uh, that is technically the law, but uh, of course it, this creates a very strange situation where the prime minister is uh, under investigation and in, uh, in about one month, we will have weekly meetings in court. So all, all the dynamics is very, very strange. Uh, uh, I think that the, the, uh, on the one hand, if uh, Netanyahu uh, was to step down tomorrow, there would be a government in five minutes. On the other hand, uh, uh, the, his own party and his own block that is like uh, almost 50% uh, are very loyal to him. So I'm unfortunately, there is the possibility of a fifth round of election. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, the way for Netanyahu to continue in government would be to find some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, agreement about uh, a limit to his term. Meaning, I guess that uh, th that was basically the agreement between him and Gantz, only uh, th that didn't go uh, as planned. But theoretically, he may he may found some parties uh, are, are willing to give him uh, a majority if he agrees to limit his, his term, let's say to two years and then uh, resign. Uh, I, I'm hearing that there are also proposals for Netanyahu to uh, become president, uh, you know, as a, as a face saving. So, no, you know, uh, but I don't think that he's interested in that. So. Mr. Shepard, what is your take on this issue? How you see? Yeah. I can't see really a, a whole party which would uh, which would join Netanyahu's block plus Yamina, uh, because so Netanyahu has 52 mandates and he needs 60 plus one. Um, he has now 52. If Yamina will join, which is another right wing religious, quasi religious, because they really made a new uh, new political platform based on small companies and and really they reinvented them, themselves in this last election. But still, if Yamina would join the Netanyahu coalition, they would have uh, 59 mand mandates. So he would need only, uh, Netanyahu would need only two other uh, politicians who would actually support him. Um, the, they don't even have to join the government. They can only support support a minority uh, uh, government. Um, and and that's something which, which happened all the time in Israeli politics, that not a whole party, but some politicians uh, moved to the um, to the to the other side. Uh, let's call it like that. So I think that definitely Netanyahu has a has a has a possibility. I also heard that they are um, contesting some of the election uh, results in certain places. So don't, you don't we don't have to think about a big uh, uh, scandal or or issue. Just uh, the the a few hundred votes. If uh, 
if Likud would won that uh, contest, then they would get one extra mandate, which would bring them to 60, which is very, very close to, to building a majority. I don't know what was the result uh, of that, um, of the, or they have the results of that uh, inquiry. So Netanyahu definitely has the, the possibility. Um, the, the question is that until now, really, it seems like the opposition is really um, um, staying very much in place and not um, moving to the side of, of Netanyahu. So at this moment, it doesn't seem like he would get the, the majority, but the possibility is open. And may I ask you about the highly unlikely scenario, but nothing is impossible, I think, in politics. Uh, what about the Arabs? So is there a possibility for Mr. Netanyahu to bring in uh, Mr. Abbas to his uh, government. I, I think it would be a, a very big surprise, but we have seen before the elections that, that Mr. Netanyahu and the Likud was trying to woo the Arabic population in northern Israel, promising better policing, better infrastructure, and there was some opening up to the 21% uh, of Israeli society who are of Arab origin. So, uh, Dr. Hayri, what is your take on this very ex extreme sounding scenario? Um, well, I, I would say this. First of all, we have to understand that the point for Netanyahu is uh, not uh, uh, finding some formula for creating a uh, a, a government for a few months, but actually finding a way to create a stable coalition. Now, the problem that all the options that are before him are very unstable. The possibility of, of having some a cooperation with one of the Arab parties is problematic because, not because they are Arabs, because they are Arabs that uh, even, uh, I think that about uh, something like, uh, three or 4% of the voters of, of the Likud are Arabs. That was the point. The point that this, these parties are uh, relatively extremist on the Israeli political scale. If there was an Arab center party, I would expect that they would be in, in a coalition with no problem. Uh, but uh, within uh, Israel, uh, Israel's uh, situation, uh, there is zero possibility of a coalition with the Arab party because the right-wing parties Veto it. There might be a possibility of having some kind of minority government with our outside, which is the same uh, that my colleague uh, uh, proposed. That maybe there are two or three uh, people who, who from another party, who like uh, live. But in all these scenarios, uh, Netanyahu would enjoy a very, very limited uh, majority with 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 very. Uh, strong strains in, in, inside it. Meaning, even if he has 61 with the Arabs, uh, he, the, the divergence of views between the, the right-wing party who want all kinds of legislation. For instance, uh, there, there, are, there is a, a lot of friction in Israel now about the areas that, are, uh, that our, the Arab population has appropriated uh, and uh, uh, how should they? Uh, how should the government um, uh, react to that? Naturally, the Arab Party wants it to be somehow uh, regularized. The right wing party says no; they, we have to throw out of these areas. So this kind of friction is naturally uh, not going to be uh, possible to overcome if the government is actually um, is uh, uh, reliant on one or two votes, because every vote will have will have this friction. The same, I think, with people you know, coming for, by the way, the, the same idea was proposed that if Lapid, uh, if the left could have a minority government, I, I believe it's the same thing. Uh, 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 there could be a minority government of the left, but again, it would, it, it would, it, it would, it could maybe stumble for a few months, but it, it couldn't really rule because of the, uh, two, the differences in, inside are too too great. So, so I don't see uh, a viable possibility for a stable government uh, based on these Arab parties. Mr. Chepregi, what is your take on this very extreme scenario? Do you see any chance of such a such a move, such a master plan? 
I absolutely agree with Dr. Haiviri that that this cannot happen if you if you start from uh, Netanyahu's current uh, allies. Uh, if Netanyahu would start with Likud and move to the to the center and the left and then include an Arab party, that could work. But again, if Netanyahu could get the the center, then he wouldn't need the the Arab party. So the problem for, for Netanyahu is not actually that much his own Likud party, but those right-wing parties who are standing right to the, to the Likud, who are more um, right-wing than, than Likud. Um, regarding the left, I, I agree that that coalition would probably not uh, be stable. So Lapid forming a government or some, even if it's a minority government or, or, or majority government with the Arab party or parties, uh, because I would also mention that if any kind of government would get into a deal with Ra'am, so the more constructive Arab party, that would create a huge pressure on the other Arab party to get some kind of a, um, a say in, in the formation of the government, the next government of, of Israel. Um, so, so that's another, another very interesting issue. But um, the, the huge... Um, uh, imbalance between Netanyahu and, and Lapid or the opposition is that Netanyahu needs a stable government. Lapid doesn't need a stable government. He just needs a few months uh, to, to recreate uh, the legal environment in Israel. And for that, Ra'am, I believe, can be a very important uh, ally. So what is the vision of Mr. Lapid? We talked about Mr. Netanyahu quite a lot. Does he have a, because we know that Mr. Netanyahu has a vision for Israel. What is the vision of Mr. Lapid? Uh, Dr. Hayim, what, what do you think? So, uh, first of all, I want to mention in, in your context that actually Lapid, if he would be prime minister, he would be the second Hungarian prime minister because his family yes. is actually of Hungarian origin. So that is uh, maybe of interest particularly to you. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, Lapid theoretically should be the person with the easiest uh, way to create a coalition because basically his, his party is centrist. So in theory, right, it's, it would be easier than anyone, even more than Netanyahu, for him to create a coalition that is left and right and center. But since the Israeli uh, electorate at the moment is very, very, very more to the right than him, he, the fact that he's a centrist party, but in fact, most of the majority of the Knesset is to his right, uh, creates a situation where uh, even if arithmetically th there are 61 uh, Knesset members who oppose Netanyahu, the, the, uh, the range of opinions, the range of views is so great that it's, uh, uh, I would say it's impossible for him to create a majority coalition. It might be possible. I, I don't think that it, it will happen, but theoretically, he could create a minority government without the Arabs, because then he could have one or two right-wing parties uh, inside his, his, uh, his government. But again, I think it, that's a very unlikely scenario. I would say that the possibility of it, of it actually happening is you know, maybe 5%, maybe even less. Mr. Chakrani, what is your take? The, the, the problem with Lapid is really that he, didn't become the kind of person like in the previous three elections you always had uh, Likud uh, with Netanyahu at its helm uh, the right wing the strong right wing party and you had the blue and white and Benny Gantz as the strong centrist leader now Israel doesn't have a strong centrist leader Benny Gantz and, and Lapid fall out so they ran on separate list uh, because of that they lost 10 uh, mandates uh, compared to, to last year. Um, something is missing from the Israeli electoral system. The, the strong, I'm not even speaking about the, the, the strong left-wing candidate because that's kind of absent for, for many, many years, but still the centrist uh, prime minister candidate is missing. Lapid is not that person right now. So, so really, I think this is the, the, the root of the problem that, that the anti-Netanyahu forces don't have the kind of leader that would be needed to, to really create a, a stable government. And, but again, I think that, that when Lapid is campaigning, like 
maybe I'm reading too much into it, but if you're reading between the lines when Lapid is saying that let's return, uh, uh, as he calls it, rationality and normalcy to Israel, he doesn't really speak about uh, uh, governing uh, for, for many, many years. He wants to shock the, the, the system, the legal environment, shock, in some sense, shock it in a, in, a, in a conservative way. So it's not like a revolution, but, but, but create uh, uh, circumstances which would exclude Netanyahu and his allies uh, from, from uh, having a grip on, on power. Now, the problem is that most of the Israeli electorate voted for the, those who are ideologically close to Netanyahu, even if they are for some personal reason don't want to sit with Netanyahu in a, in a government. So I think that the goals of Lapid uh, are, are, are kind of different than, than Netanyahu and, and he wants, he needs a few weeks or months of, of governing and not, not really more to recreate the system. And again, it's interesting. I, I, would, uh, I would say that in the new system, Lapid will still not become a, a stable prime minister because he's too not representative of the current uh, um, views of the majority of the Israeli electorate. But still, it can change the, the future of Israel in a, in a huge way. Thank you. So what is your prediction? I'm asking all the two panelists. Uh, is there, will there will be a fifth selection? What do you think? Is there a chance? But is what has the bigger chance to have a fifth selection or to have an unstable government for, let's say, a year? Uh, <clears throat> my view is that uh, there is a, a slightly larger chance of uh, um, finding some formula uh, um, rather than having a fifth election. There is a very strong. Uh, um, reluctance in Israel, including by Netanyahu, for a fifth election. And the reasons are two. First of all, naturally, a fifth election is not something that anyone wants. But specifically for Netanyahu, the, the, the problem is that uh, there is a, an ironic twist here. Because when Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, one year ago, created a naturally, national unity government, uh, because of the, mis the mutual mistrust between them, they changed the uh, basic law, the government basic law, uh, stating that after 18 months of Netanyahu uh, being prime minister, Gantz would become, re would replace him automatically. Now, since Netanyahu uh, uh, brought Israel to early elections, he, he believed that he would win, but he didn't. Now, if there's a fifth round, and no one, and let's say that this, the situation from now is repeated, meaning no one has a clear majority, then whatever happens automatically in November, Gantz is prime minister. Mm -hmm. so it's a, ironically, for Netanyahu, a fifth election is, I would say, I, I don't say a catastrophe, but it, it would be almost anything that than go that way. So, uh, so uh, uh, basically, I think it, uh, this for this reason, he has a very strong incentive to try to find some solution, even at the cost of his own interest. Now, what would be the cost? There were there were two basic possibilities of other par other parties joining his coalition and giving him, him a majority. The first, both are long shots, but they exist. The first is uh, uh, creating a coalition where Netanyahu, th there's a new legislation where Netanyahu's uh, there is a term limit. In, in one year or two years, that cannot be changed. And so they give Netanyahu another period and that's it. Or obviously the, the opposite, creating a, a national coalition government like the one that just fell a few months ago. But in this case, the other prime minister with a rotation would not be Netanyahu. Meaning, let's say that uh, Lapid or Bennett or some other party leader becomes prime minister and Netanyahu would be then deferred to two years in the future when theoretically his trial would be over. And then the, 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 the uh, objection to his, uh, uh, to his continued rule, part of it at least disappears. Now, uh, my sense is that Netanyahu would prefer the second option for various reasons. But again, the, both of these are long shots. 
Uh, so uh, that's that's what I can say for the moment. Um, I have two contradicting uh, opinions, and the, the the reason for my 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 first notion would be that there would be a minority lapid led government, uh, and it would lead to a few months of transitional uh, era, and then another elections, uh, which would be uh, without the participation of Netanyahu for some legal reason, and uh, and now. Like after this election was very humbling to many uh, politicians in Israel. It was humbling to Naftali Bennett. It was humbling to Gideon Saar. And it was, I believe, very humbling to, to Yair Lapid himself. Uh, all of them thought uh, in his mind and also during the campaign speeches that they would be the prime minister candidate uh, on the opposite side of Netanyahu. And actually, honestly, neither of them was. Uh, not even Lapid, as, as, uh, as, as I argued. Uh, previously. So I think that a fifth election would be very different from the previous one because now the candidates know their, their value uh, much better. Um, so, so on the one hand, I would, I would suggest this, that, that Netanyahu won't have a way to get into a deal with anyone because, because nobody trusts him anymore. Um, but my other opinion is that you, you must, you never underestimate uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And all the time when it was predicted that he would going, uh, that he will lose, that he will get out of power, he always managed to form a coalition. It was always the other Israeli politicians who budged in the end and got into a deal with with uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu. So, so there's really the problem of of um, of of the political calculations, which for me would show uh, some kind of a, a, a minority government led by, by Lapid and a revolution. But, uh, but history shows that, that human traits uh, uh, win over political calculations and some opposition, currently opposition politician will join Net Netanyahu uh, in some kind of a rotation deal and get into the similar situation that Benny Gantz did a year ago. Thank you. I propose to move a bit from uh, internal Israeli politics to, to global politics. And there was a big change in January for Israel with the, the new administration in the United States, the Biden administration. And, and we know that, uh, that Mr. Latvania had a very conflicting, very not very good relations with the, with the previous Democratic president, uh, President Obama. And we also see in the United States, which, is, which was for decades the strongest ally of, of Israel, uh, move to be more critical, at least on the democratic side and the, the, le and the left side of the Democratic Party, to be more critical of, uh, of Israel, which, which, is a, which is a new phenomenon. That's how I, I see. Do you agree or how do you see the Israeli-American relations moving? Whether if Netanyahu stays in government, whether if Mr. Lapid will form a new government, still there is a change. There is maybe an important change in the US uh, Israeli relations. How do you see it, uh, uh, Mr. Hayegui, Dr. Hayegui? Uh, well, uh, there, there are two, two important factors at work here. First of all, clearly, Netanyahu, there, there is uh, a lot of animosity towards Netanyahu in the uh, Biden administration, because many of the uh, leaders of the Biden uh, White House, especially in the foreign policy, are actually veterans of the Obama administration. So uh, um, they carried with, with them this baggage. However, on the other hand, th there is also the fact that there is a, uh, I would say, uh, there has been a significant change in the, uh, I would say, the, um, the, the dynamics and the goals of the US in its foreign policy, especially as to the Middle East. Meaning uh, uh, there, there has been a clear retrenchment of American interventionism and uh, projecting power and even ambition all over the world, I believe, and uh, uh, even more in the Middle East. Um, there, there are various reasons for it. Uh, America used to be the sole superpower. Now it's more balanced. Uh, uh, clearly, Ob Obama, as well as Trump, 
you know, we cannot think of two politicians that are more different than Trump and, and Obama. However, both of them expressed this reluctance of America now to be so much involved in foreign policy than the previous era, let's say until, until uh, uh, George, the second Bush administration, uh, there was a concern, American consensus that America should be involved virtually everywhere. Now, since Obama, it has gone back, and even, even if Biden in a sense is, is more of a throwback to a former area, I don't see in America the, any appetite for starting, but this is clearly the case. And in the Middle East, in a sense, it's even uh, more uh, significant because on the one hand, the area has become less important for America because it's less reliant on its oil. On the other hand, it, the area is far more of a mess now because so many of the countries are failed states or semi-failed states, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Iraq is like, so in, in all this situation, uh, I would say that, that uh, America hasn't have, that doesn't have such a large uh, uh, percentage of its interests now in the Middle East and all its natural allies are, uh, I would say it, it, it's, it's far, it's become far uh, less close to its natural allies than before. Uh, with Israel, ma mainly because of Netanyahu, uh, with Turkey, natu naturally because uh, of the Erdogan policies, uh, and also uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. So actually, the situation now is uh, that that uh, uh, my my view is that America uh, is uh, more or less going through the motions of the Middle East. There doesn't seem to be any vision or or need or ambition to be so much involved. So in this sense, I think that the friction with between America and Israel, even, even considering the Yao's role would be lessened because there's less, there's less place for friction because uh, Biden is more interested in, in China, in other things and so on. Yes, it's, it's really interesting to see and compare how uh, Barack Obama had started his presidency with really going to everyone apart from Israel in the Middle East to apologize, to, to claim that there would be a new kind of uh, Middle East policy from the United States. And, and really Biden, apart from some uh, promises regarding the Iran uh, file, um, he didn't really, I, I wouldn't say care, but but it's really not on the top of his agenda, which I believe it's perfectly fine for Israel. Uh, there couldn't be a better thing that uh, that the United States could do, which which would be better for Israel, because when the United Sta uh, States uh, claim, uh, I completely agree that it's there's a kind of a retrenchment uh, going on, focusing on internal issues, other uh, areas in the world, such as the such as the China uh, competition with China or Russia. Then uh, Washington is basically saying to the Middle Eastern region, and by the way, the Eastern Mediterranean region, that um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not there uh, at, at this moment with all my attention and forces. Um, please refer to my regional allies. And when, it, when, it, when the United States is not there, that means that if you want some kind of a support, really major and trustworthy support, you have to go to Israel. And that's something that, that um, regardless of any uh, other policies of the Trump administration, that's something that you can really see um, that was um, very much welcomed in the Middle East and, and other, um, even, even those kind of countries which were not very happy with the Trump policy, they were answering to the call uh, that um, that it's in their interest to partner with Israel if the United States is not allocating uh, so much attention and energy to the Middle East. So I would argue that yes, the the, the Biden administration is a um, is not taking that much attention to to uh, to the Middle East, uh, but it's kind of. Uh, pra pragmatically, it's a continuation of the Trump policy in the sense that it's going to push together the regional actors um, to, uh, to cooperate with Israel. And I would argue that, that at this moment, that's the best uh, outcome that Israel can hope for. Yes, uh, but there is one thing you mentioned, Iran. 
there is a change of uh, maybe there's a change of tone, but maybe there's a change of heart in this regarding uh, Iran. And Tehran is a major concern for, for Israel. How do you see it, Dr. Haiti? Is there a chance that the Americans uh, will rejoin uh, the nuclear agreement without uh, without uh, the prior prior discussion with uh, with the Jerusalem? Uh, there is no chance that there will be no prior discussion, but there may there might be discussion and disagreement, meaning. Uh, uh, Let's say uh, I believe that on, on the Iran matter, uh, the Biden administration is probably closer, far closer the, uh, to the Obama view than the, the than the Trump view. Now the, it might be that the uh, the Biden administration would try to enter a renewed agreement with Iran, uh, having uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, Correction, but it's very hard for me to see any agreement uh, that America reaches with Iran that is agreeable to Israel uh, in general. Because I, I don't see the um, the appetite at the moment uh, in America for trying to force Iran to give up its nuclear program altogether, and for Israel, nothing less than that is a good outcome so basically this is actually this is one point where there might be friction uh, in, in the sense that israel will lead a far more uh aggressive uh, policy toward iran where the us will try to uh reach some an agreement now in the last uh, uh four years actually israel has converged uh, far more publicly with other countries in the region, including Saudi Arabia and others, uh, as for Iran. And uh, this has, in a sense, uh, um, I would say, uh, made the possibility of a military uh, option uh, higher. Because uh, the moment that the feeling in Israel is that the US will not uh, force the Iranians to scale down their nuclear program, then the options are narrowing towards a, a military solution. Yes, and it's not surprising that, that the problem with getting a deal between the Washington and, and, uh, and Tehran is that, is that Iran, would, would, Iran, Iran would only get into a deal if it would be pressured Really, so hard that that um, that the political elite would have to make a kind of a compromise. It's not a surprising uh, phenomenon that whenever the pressure is getting too high on Iran, China is uh, throwing a uh, a a lifeboat uh, to the Iranians. And at that moment, uh, the Iranians are not anymore in a corner, and they don't have to. Um, um, settle for any kind of uh, agreement with the United States. Um, so, so I really don't see a, also don't see a possibility for, for, a, for a deal. And I would also mention that any kind of American appeasement policy with Iran would need a very strong uh, Israel and uh, Sunni coalition, because you always have to have uh, the, the, the other um, scenario in your negotiation. If you want, if paradoxically, if the United States wants to get a deal from Iran, it has to show that that okay, the other option, if you're not, if Iran is not getting into a deal, that it will find itself in, uh, in the neighborhood of a very assertive Sunni-Israeli uh, coalition. So, so in a sense, even if we are getting to a deal, we won't see it because because. Um, because the stakes have to be very, very high, even before the deal uh, is, is being set. Until the last moment, the, the tension will be very high. So the problem is really, really this. When the tensions are getting high, it can indicate that there's a, a military conflict in the, in the beginning um, or, or a negotiation which would settle uh, the conflict. It's a very, very uh, problematic uh, dynamic that, uh, that we're now seeing. I'm is running fast. I had a stream of questions, but uh, I, I think I'm going to pose 
only one and then give the floor to the audience. There is a fashionable catchphrase, um, catchphrase nowadays in Israel that Russia is our new neighbor. Of course, Russia, it's a uh, meaning about Russia's role in, in Syria. So how do you see uh, uh, from Israel the Russian role in Syria? What is the Russian game plan? Uh, in, in Syria, do you have any uh, any predictions of how long the Russians will stay in Syria and what their role was there? Was it uh, positive from Israelis' views, or you see it negatively? Well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, in the Middle East, you always think of the alternative, meaning uh, in Syria, the alternatives to Russia. Uh, are mainly uh, an Iranian control of Syria. So in this sense, Russia is seen in Israel as a moderating element. Uh, uh, Israel is not blind to the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, less uh, uh, pl playable aspects of the Putin regime, but it is regarded as a regime with which uh, we can, uh, have a rational and uh, a, a rational uh, discourse about interest, while naturally uh, the Assad regime and uh, the Iranians are regarded in Israel as uh, far more problematic. So basically, at the moment, Israel sees uh, Russia, Russia's role in Syria as actually stabilizer and assisting Israel to draw its red lines. Uh, as you may, may know, Israel is conducting uh, regular attacks against uh, uh, Iranian bases in Syria. And this, is, this can be only done because there is a very high degree of, uh, I won't say cooperation, but understanding with the Russians because, because clearly there, there is uh, a, a dialogue that uh, makes sure that there is no situation where the Russians are uh, and the Israelis co are confronting each other in Syria. So the areas where Israel is active is uh, known to the, to the Russians and they are very careful not to interfere because they understand uh, that, that Israel cannot uh, allow Iran to establish itself further in Syria. And uh, uh, also it's, uh, it's also uh, serving the Russian interest to, for Israel to hold the Iranians a bit lower. So basically, I would say that uh, uh, the Russian presence in Syria is not ideal for Israel, but it's uh, at the moment it's the. Uh, I would say that considering the other elements in the area are the Isla Islamist militia, the Assad regime, the Iranians and Erdogan from Turkey, basically the Russians are the lesser evil, the lesser evil here. So the, that's the element where Israel is, uh, uh, it's easier for Israel to deal with. I, I also just wanted to mention the, the, the factor of Turkey that really, that, Iran is the worst case scenario in the short term for Israel um, in, in Syria, but, but in the midterm and the long term, a, a, a regionally more assertive Turkey would be more uh, threatening to, to Israel. So, and really Russia is not in a position to reassert itself in the way that the Soviet Union did um, with, with Syria, where really Syria was seen as, the convention, as a conventional uh, military threat to, to Israel now, it's it's uh, it's an asymmetric uh, military threat, and, and it's going to be like that for the foreseeable future. And it's it's I completely agree. It's thanks to the to the Russian presence. So um, there won't be any change in that in the in the future. Um, yeah. okay, thank you. I think we have a question. I should read it. Uh, okay, this is a question from one of our students. May Israel change its policy towards the Palestinians as a result of the elections? 
what will it be like? So I guess the question is talking about if Mr. Lapid uh, is going to be the prime minister, would he change Israel's policy uh, towards the Palestinians? What do you think, gentlemen? Well, uh, I would say that uh, in theory, maybe he would, but in practice, it's, it is uh, impossible for several reasons. First of all, if Lapid, if, even if he can create a coalition, it would be with several right-wing parties. So at, at any event, the, the policies he could further wouldn't be different basically from Netanyahu. But more, I would say even more important is that there is at the moment no uh, uh, dynamic of, uh, of um, real discussion from the uh, uh, Palestinian Authority side, because uh, it's not that Israel decided in the last uh, two or three or four years to stop talking with the Palestinians. The, the, the fact was that there was no point to the dialogue because the, the, the views of both sides are so, so far away now, and uh, the Palestinians are unwilling to, uh, uh, to compromise on the one hand, and they have lost all their all their important levers on Israel. They, they used to have two or three lever, levers on Israel. Uh, um, they had in the last, I would say, since the Oslo Accord, a, a, a some level of uh, uh, support in the American administrations until the Trump administration. And so under Clinton and Bush and Obama, there was some level of support on that level. And also naturally the Arab country. In, now in both cases, uh, during the Trump era, era uh, the, the American policy has become far more aligned with Israel views. And in the last years, the, uh, the I would say the pressure from Arab countries on Israel has disappeared for two reasons. The anti-Israeli Arab countries have virtually evaporated, meaning the, the, the power of countries like uh, Syria and Iraq and so on is non-existent. And on the other hand, countries like uh, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia and so forth are uh, now far more aligned with Israel in a coalition against Iran and against uh, Islamists. So the, the traditional levers that Palestinians used against Israel are basically gone. Now, it, this might change somewhat under Biden, but still my view is that uh, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian issue is, is very low, very, very low on the, on the Biden uh, administration uh, agenda. So, Basically, uh, there will be uh, for Lapid uh, uh, very little po uh, political possibility within the Israeli parties and very little possible, uh, I would say, uh, benefit on the, on the international level. So my view is that he wouldn't really change uh, the policies, especially as, the, as at the moment, the Palestinians are split between Gaza and, uh, and uh, the Ramallah government, which means also that, that any kind of negotiations are very limited in scope because the Palestinian president can talk only for about 50% of the Palestinians because the other half doesn't recognize his rule and so on. Yes, uh when we talk about the elections, and of course at this um, event we mean the Israeli elections, but I would argue that that really the continuing um, with the with notion of the Palestinians being separated between each other is that it's much more important what will happen with the Palestinian elections, which are set to happen in the in the following months in in few stages, or actually if the elections will happen at all. Um, I don't think that Lapid uh, would change the policy of Israel uh, for two reasons. The first is that we oftentimes try to, to see from, from Europe um, Israeli politics as having Netanyahu on the right wing and anyone else who's against him is on the left. 
uh, and and Lapid is not a left wing person uh, in 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 the kind of uh, way that we think about left wing and right wing in Israel or previously Benny Gantz was not a left wing uh, person so the Israeli mindset regarding security and and regarding um, the 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 securing the the country is is very um, different from what uh, what uh, certain uh, peace groups uh, would understand uh, uh, as um, as the policy that should be found. So when you ask Lapid, he would say uh, regarding the Israel-Palestinian conflict that the most important thing is keeping Israel secure. And the end of the discussion. And then you can talk about the minor, the more minor points of the peace agreement. But security comes first. Uh, that wouldn't change. And if that doesn't um, uh, change, then the the policies of Netanyahu and Lapid regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would not be that much different. The more interesting thing would be not the leaders of the parties, but the coalition partners. Netanyahu, if uh, he managed just to create a coalition, then it would be very right-wing, maybe the most right-wing coalition that governed Israel for many, many years. Uh, if Yair Lapid would come uh, to become a prime minister, then he would have very left-wing parties or even Arab parties uh, supporting him. So there would be a lot of... Um, Diplomatic talk uh, regarding restarting the the peace uh, the peace process, but unless there's not there's no uh, party on the other side, then this would be only public diplomacy and not real uh, not a real process. There's a question from Dora Switch, our international director. Uh, given the recent changes, how do you see the future significance of the Abraham Accords? Uh, well, um, my feeling is that uh, uh, the Abraham, Abraham Accords uh, will be uh, basically, um, there, there, will be, there, there won't be any effect on them by the internal upheavals in Israel because the Accords are uh, basically supported by, I would say, I would say between 80 and 90 percent of the Israeli uh, parties and population. There, there is no um, uh, real uh, um, disagreement within the Israeli political spectrum about the accords and about their, uh, their goals. Meaning the, the, the accords are based on, I would say, two legs. One is uh, the uh, a cooperation of uh, several countries in the region uh, against the Iranian threat. And the, another is finding a, a, I would say, a more uh, substantial cooperation between these countries in e economic uh, and other aspects. And I think that both of these aspects are agreed by virtually everyone in the Israeli political spectrum. It's an Israeli interest. There is no. In, on this point, there's no difference at all between Lapid and Netanyahu and right wing and left wing. So basically my feeling is that the, the, the accords will, uh, uh, will continue and even probably there might be some countries that will join them. There, there are some talk about Saudi Arabia, uh, maybe not immediately, but maybe other Gulf countries and, and other Arab countries might join in this sense. Uh, I would say that the the uh, the actually the fact that the Biden administration is trying to find some kind of understanding with Iran even strengthens these accords because basically it draws the the Arab Sunni countries and Israel closer together if if America is seen as as actually appeasing Iran. So in this sense, I cannot see a scenario where the accords are in fact fortified in the in the coming future. I agree, and and also one interesting issue that I would highlight is that always it's Saudi Arabia, and for very right reasons, it's Saudi Arabia which is mentioned that that they are kind of the end goal for Israel. Uh, when Saudi Arabia joins the Abraham Accords or any kind of uh, deal which is similar to the Abraham Accords, so a normalization uh, deal with Israel. Um, 
I would argue that it's not really Saudi Arabia, which is the end goal, because the, the Abraham Accords are only partly new. Uh, they are they are new in the economic uh, sphere, but in the security uh, sphere, they are not new. They are just something which happened under the rug uh, for many, many years. And it, it was called the mistress syndrome when Israel was kind of the mistress of the Arab countries, engaging with them on, on security issues. Um, and uh, But the Arab countries were not um, acknowledging this relationship. Um, so, so this is something which happened now. They, they just, you know, one gear up. Uh, the economic issues are very important, and I would highlight um, something uh, which was very surprising to me, honestly, when, uh, when the United States was very against uh, the Israelis selling ports uh, to China. Uh, it was actually a uh, company from the United Arab Emirates which came to the rescue and invested a lot of money uh, to Israel to buy uh, port facilities in Haifa. Uh, just on the opposite side of the other port area, which came to the possession of the Chinese. So it's very interesting to see that the Abraham Accords are creating an environment where uh, America can really balance Chinese influence in the region. But something that I would add, uh, I mentioned that Saudi Arabia is usually seen as the end goal, but I would argue that the Palestinians are the, are the end goal in the sense that when the Palestinians... Um, come to the realization that engaging with Israel in some kind of a, um, a deal which would be mutually beneficial, which would open up the, the economic and, and societal possibilities that Israel can offer, that would create, create a huge pressure on the Palestinians to change their policy, and especially on the young ones. And really, it's not a surprise. If you, can, if you look at the Facebook page and, and certain videos that the Emiratis and the Israelis are putting on the internet uh, and when tourism will be on and you will see Emiratis visiting Israel and vice versa, um, going to the Arab communities in Haifa and in other places in Israel, that would show the Palestinian youth that they are missing out on something. So I would argue that really the Abraham Accords and the coronavirus crisis really stopped that aspect of the of the Abraham Accords, but it will come uh, into play on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict also. We have a question from the audience, but you said something interesting about China. So let me just go up on that. How is the Chinese intervention far? There were even military deals in, uh, in the 1990s between China and Israel. How are Chinese efforts to, to make deals with Israel, how the United States is viewing the Chinese attempts to, to make deals with Israel, and how the Israelis are viewing China. Should I answer? Um, well, I, I would say that on the economic level, uh, Israel is naturally um, very happy to do business with China. And uh, there is no basic, uh, uh, I would say there is no basic conflict of interest on the economic front between China and Israel. And like many other places where the, eco the economic power of China is uh, uh, undermining many industries in other countries, including the US, in Israel, the economies are so different. In Israel, there is very little manufacturing anyway. So the, most of the, of the economy is based on uh, high tech and all kinds of uh, very high level uh, uh, technological uh, um, aspects. So there is no real uh, you know, uh, problem of competition with the Chinese. I would say that the problem with the Chinese is more political, Me meaning on one on one side the the clear uh, the the I would say the uh, rising tension between America and China puts Israel in a in a very uneasy uh, situation because clearly it is aligned with with the, the U.S. and and there are various aspects. I would say every few months some kind of uh, Israeli economic deal with the Chinese uh, creates some kind of friction or problem with the Americans, not only when it's uh, specific, some techno 
some technological or some military technology, but many times other aspects of uh, uh, of economic uh, competition within the US and China that creates problems. Uh, this is towards America, but also there is another aspect that the Chinese policy is currently, uh, I would say, it's not, it's not at all anti-Israeli, but it's uh, um, going in directions that are closer to countries that are uh, very, uh, that, is, that Israel sees them as its enemies, meaning mainly Iran. China is cooperating closer and closer with Iran. So even if the intent of the Chinese is not, is not at all to create a conflict with Israel, uh, the fact that they are supporting or, or indirectly supporting Iran creates potential friction with Israel. And even it's, uh, uh, there is also some level of uh, a growing cooperation with uh, Turkey, which is also a country that Israel in the last few years has become, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is moving farther and farther away from uh, cooperation with Israel. So in this sense, I think that uh, there are elements that are working towards putting a, a widening distance between China and Israel, although there are not basic, uh, there is no basic friction between China and Israel, but the, I would say the outside factors are driving them a bit uh, farther from each other. So I think that Israel is having a, it's having a structural shift between being a small power, which is very innovative and fighting for its survival, the, the, the traditional narrative, and being a regional great power. And right now what we see is that Israel is using two narratives when it argues in Washington about its policies. On the one hand, it says that, uh, that Israel is a, is a regional great power and that's why it, it uh, should engage in regional coalitions uh, with the Arab states and, and fight for its interests. But on the other hand, when it comes to China and economic uh, engagement, it says that, that, that Israel is a small country, it's only engaging with in, in economic uh, partnerships. Um, so the problem is that, well, not the problem, but, but the fact is that the uh, United States is, is really aware of the, the danger of Israel uh, transferring civilian technology to the Chinese, which can be used in military affairs. So we, during the 90s, as, as you have mentioned, um, Attila, that, that really um, um, military technology was the issue. And really there, the United States said, no, stop, this cannot go to the Chinese. Now it's civilian technologies, which are dual use. So actually the United States pressured Israel into having a new national security uh, review system of the investments. Um, and it's, this is something that Israel was doing quite reluctantly because, of course, Israel, the Israeli state is a very complex state where you have different interest groups, such as the, the army, uh, the economic uh, sphere and, uh, and the political sphere. And even though Israel, I think it's a very good example of a country which is very unified in, uh, in maintaining the principles of the country. Even if we talk about elections and fourth and fifth elections, the, the core of the country is very uh, uh, unified and knows its interest. But getting these new structures are very difficult. So I think that in the future, we will see more and more issues like not selling certain ports uh, to the Chinese uh, partners, not giving certain uh, technologies. And it will be really hard because on the other hand, China can, can say that, that we came here for civilian technologies. Why are you rejecting us? Um, so Israel is going to be stuck in this, in this uh, US-China uh, conflict. But as the professor said, really once Israel cannot really know that those technologies are not going to end up with Iran, it's, it's their self-interest not, uh, not to sell these technologies to the Chinese. So there was one question on the B4 Israel cooperation. Can, could I have the question up again? So during the, the last week of presidency, there has been there, there has been a launch of the closer V4 Israeli cooperation. How do you see Israel's approach to our region in the upcoming years? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The... During, during the last 
last V4, Visegrad 4 presidents, it, there was a launch of a closer V4, Visegrad for Israel cooperation. So between Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Israel closer cooperation. How do you see Israel's approach to our region, Central Europe, in the upcoming years? So, so I'm just to make sure there is a bit of a problem with the sound. You are asking about uh, Israel vis-a-vis -vis the, the the Central and Eastern European countries, especially V4. So Poland, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, okay. Slovakia. Okay. I understand. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, certainly Netanyahu uh, has concentrated. Uh, a lot of his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, efforts on, on the V4 group. And I believe that uh, uh, if, if someone else is prime minister, especially if Lapid is prime minister, this might change a bit. But I think that more significant for Israel is to uh, understand the internal dynamics of the European Union because there was, I would say, until about 10 years ago, the, the feeling was that there was a very strong push towards unification of policies and uh, foreign policy and economic policy of the European Union. And in Israel, there was the tendency to see more and more uh, the European Union as uh, one entity. And uh, in the last decade, basically, uh, and I think that uh, especially in the last four or five years, because uh, uh, Brexit, of course, and, and the Trump presidency put this in, into perspective, uh, this has changed. And now it's clearer to Israel, and I think clearly to Europe, that this narrative of an ever closer union into one European super state is not uh, I don't know what will happen, but anyway, it's not agreed on everyone that this is the goal. And so the question is, what if this uh, uh, apparent uh, unanimity is not on the cards anymore, what does it mean for the European Union? Does it mean that the Union becomes, in effect, a confederation of two or three groupings? Maybe you have the before, and then you have the Germans and the French, and maybe the, the, uh, the Mediterranean countries, whatever. So it's, it's a, I think it's really unclear from the Israeli point of view uh, where the European uh, Union is going. Clearly at, the, at this moment, especially, I think that in the context of the COVID virus, um, uh, it, it, it's become even clearer that uh, there are very strong strains within the European Union between the, uh, the member states and having a common policy. Uh, so basically I think that uh, uh, the question is mainly uh, Israel will want to study and see the direction in which the European Union is going. And I don't think that there is a a uh, prepared view or a prepared policy towards the European Union, uh, but uh, but rather a desire to understand where this uh, great political entity is going. I agree with the with the political uh, implications. I would just add the the a bit on the economic one. It was mentioned by Professor Haivri that that uh, Israel doesn't really have a. a a very huge manufacturing industry. And here in the V4, we, we do have, and our economies are very reliant on manufacturing. What we need is technology and capital. Uh, and Israel can provide both. Even if it not indirectly, uh, I once heard that it's much easier to uh, get American money in Tel Aviv for your company than going actually to, to Washington or New York. So in that sense, Israel is very important, not only as a source, but as a, as a gateway or a node for technology and, and, and capital. And also on the flip side, Israel needs it. If Israel cannot really engage with China that deeply, so it needs new markets, it needs new manufacturing uh, regions. And the Visegrad Corporation can, can provide 
uh, that for Israel. So the economic front and the scientific front, front is very, very promising. I think one of the problems that we have to watch out for in the coming months is that the V4 is currently not really unified uh, on, on Israel and not in the main vision that Professor Haivri uh, outlined and, and, um, and uh, what I mentioned regarding the economy, but certain um, um, more daily political issues. You could see the Czech uh, prime minister going to Jerusalem, opening an official uh, office of the Tel Aviv embassy. So it's quite blurry what they actually did and what they actually mean, but still they gave they gave kind of an official nod to, to Jerusalem as the, as the capital of, uh, of Israel. Uh, Hungary, of course, has excellent relations with, with Israel on, on basically all fronts. But right now, the, po the, the Polish government has some uh, issues uh, with, with Israel, and that really, really takes away some of the momentum uh, from the Visegrad for Israel relationship. So honestly, that's something that I'm sure that there are quiet discussions regarding that in the in the background. But but, but that kind of unity in the V4 about Israel uh, is um, it kind of has a gap in in these months, and that's something that has to be overcome when the new Israeli government is uh, is uh, is coming into power.